because he has lots of interesting things to tell. Um, just want to tell you what he does. He is a senior cybersecurity consultant at Lemon Shark, Dutch company, and he has lots of interests, I mean from SIEM and SOC to pen testing to compliance. I asked him why, and he says, I just like too many things. Well, that's what we recognize, right? We like to have so many things. That's why this whole program is so diverse, and that's why we'd like to have you on stage. So please, a warm welcome for Don't Turn Your Back on Ransomware, Eric Heskes. Hi everyone, I hope you have a good time. I'm definitely enjoying myself and absolutely fantastic. These things are being okay now again to uh, meet each other in person. Absolutely great. So today we're going to have a talk about ransomware and we probably know what it is. And I first have a question for you. Can I see some hands? Who actually was involved with a real ransomware attack in some way? Definitely a couple of us are. So um, I was a victim, and as well, I've been performing these exercises, like tabletop exercises, and it isn't as exciting as it sounds. But anyway, ransomware is still here, and the attacks are only increasing, and I think I'm not exaggerating. Um, as you take all uh, of the computer systems in the world, it might be the case that 50% or more are involved with some kind of ransomware attack. Now, let's have um, a view of what we're going to talk today about. I'm going to show some uh, ransomware history. I'm going to show, show some examples of ransomware. Obviously, I'm going to give a demonstration. And at the end, we're going to look at what we can do to defend ourselves and to put some eyes and detection on ransomware indicator for compromise. So let's start. Yeah, ransomware, you probably know what it is. Um, it is a digital way of, well, you can say hijacking, but I like to call it um, a digital way of extortion. And usually, um, the Bitcoin is a very popular way to um, release whatever, what has been hijacked. So what the attacker will do when he is encrypting the files, he will use a form of hybrid encryption. That means that he will benefit from both the speed from the semantic algorithm as the uh, confidentiality and integrity which involves the um, asymmetric algorithm. So we basically, he will first encrypt everything with a semantic algorithm and that encryption key uh, will be encrypted with an asymmetric algorithm. All right, so here is a timeline of all the, uh, a lot of ransomware species that occurred uh, around the globe, and it's uh, quite a lot. And if I am going to um, summarize all of these, uh, then I, I think we can stay here for hours, so I'm not going to do that. But keep in mind that before uh, all of these ransomware species uh, were released, it was, I think, in the 80s, there was a guy who uh, went to a uh, conference and uh, had a list of anyone intended and was giving, handing out free software to all of them. Now, next, when you install this software, your computer was automatically rebooted and there was a system displayed. Well, if you like your software, please uh, put some money in an envelope and send it over to me and then I will release it. So, eventually, uh, there was Joseph Pop. He got caught, and I think that was the first ransomware um, attempt ever. And next, there were also uh, non-encrypting kind of ransomware, like the screen lockers. You have seen probably a threatening messages from the police or from the FBI, FBI, and your explorer with a message to pay a fine, or you will get prosecuted, anything like that. Very scary. But actually, it was harmless. It was a browser message. You can click it away, and then nothing happens. But actually, some people fall for it and either pay the fine or showed up at the FBI to turn themselves in. Now, if you look at the CryptoLocker, for instance, um, 
This uh, was the first edition ever making use uh, of Bitcoin as payment and introducing the Zeus Banking Trojan as extra edition to extort even more money by attacking for financial gain. And then a lot of species um, arise, like the Serbit Tesla crypt, we got into the WannaCry misery, where a lot of financial damage also in Holland um, occurred. And the ransomware also started to advance, like spreading over the network, uh, making use of data exfiltration, and try to disable your backups, like happened in Maze and GrandCrab, Clop, etc. And now we uh, had some uh, incidents with Lapsus Dollar, we have Lockbit, Black Cat, and the list goes on and on. So, lately we had an incident with Microsoft, that was the Lapsus Dollar Group, and they uh, were also be able to exfiltrate some of their code. We had an incident with the Media Markt in November 2001, which was done by Rensburg Group, the Hive, and the Hive will also uh, attack a hospital if they got a chance. We got a supply chain attack organized by R Evil, and that means that uh, CASI is actually the software maintaining other clients' infrastructure, and they managed to encrypt all their clients' infrastructure by means of that exploit, and then the way the fast that it came, the fast it also ends because the decryption key was eventually disclosed. The colonial pipeline, uh, um, to have an idea about the impact, um, is providing the fuel for the planes. So in Washington, the planes were kept on the ground as a result of that attack. And obviously, uh, Ryuk, also a very fierce one, attacked some hospitals uh, in America. And there is even a rumor that it actually also caused a human casualty. I don't know if that's true. Okie doke. So if you combine all the services, they join their forces. Uh, even they have all these elements, like the one who is uh, providing the software, doing the negotiations, and etc. You put all the elements in a big bowl and stir it, you have something that is Ransomware is a service, and as you can see, that it's a really money-making product. And also, ransomware groups are now combining and buying stuff for, uh, from each other and handing out knowledge to become even bigger, to be more successful. Um, and you look at this, this kill chain, it kind of likes look a cyber kill chain. It also starts with a um, delivery where you can first send an email for a phishing attack with an attachment to gain foothold to your system. <coughs> oh, sorry about that. Yeah, sorry about that. That was in the wrong hole. <laughs> now, after having the foothold and there is a callback to the attacker server, all the files will be encrypted by means of that asymmetric algorithm. And the ransomware will actually show a message in order to pay. Now, if this happens on a single system, it could be a server or a network device, anything like that. Well, we call that an attack type one. When the attack will also try to do some lateral movement, we're going to look for that later in the demonstration, and we'll try to uh, exfiltrate sensitive information and also make sure that the backups are unusable. We call that a type two attack. So for the demonstration, we're going to first have a look at a victim, which we can fish with an email attachment with having microfarus in it and some malware for, to gain some foothold. Next, we're going to look for some accounts which are on that system and try to raise our privileges and see if there are more accounts we are interested in. And eventually, we're going to target a domain controller and the end goal is to encrypt the domain controller and to deploy our malware over there. 
So I would say just sit back and relax. Then we're going to start the demonstration. So in this first step, we're creating a phishing email. And the phishing email uh, could have some social engineering in, uh, as well, because the receiver might expect an email from someone which is sending in a presentation. Take some time to type this message. OK, now the email has been sent. Not sure if you see this red dot, probably not. It arrives in the inbox, in the inbox of the victim. Try to open it. It seems that it's coming from a trusted sender. And next, the email attachment is opened, and there is a PowerPoint presentation in it. OK, so let's see what's going to happen now. The victim enables the content, very smart thing to do. And in the meanwhile, well, we all know the victim catch the bait. In the background, there was already a listener started, and now we have a reverse shell. And this is the first step of the attack. OK, so the connection has been enabled. Going to move to the next one. However, uh, in my example, I used the macro. And does it necessarily have to be so? Not so long ago, there was a zero-day vulnerability. Uh, you probably have seen it, the Folina, which is making use of the Microsoft diagnostic, uh, diagnostic tool. And that's also a way to provide foothold. So the victim opens this Word document. And in this scenario, also a reverse shell is being set up in the background. OK, and that's that. We're going to look at the next step, and that is privilege escalation now. Privilege escalation is quite a complex thing, so I took some shortcuts here and there also in order to save time. In this example, we're going to look um, to listen on the network for events we can use in order to um, catch some event which will give us the password of a particular user we're after. So this user is trying to look for a particular server on the network. However, there is no such server. But in the background, negotiation will take place anyway. So there is a listener running. And if I'm correct, there is also a hash being captured by the tool. And this closed the user's password. So now we have a user's password. Next, a very nice feature in Windows is auto log on. And when you enable that, for the attacker, can look for that registry key and see if actually someone enabled that with a clear text password. It's a very easy thing to extract the information and to have the administration password. I'm not saying that it will happen uh, often, but it can be the case. So, and there we go. We've got also now the local admin password. So we already have a running shell in the background. Now we want to upgrade that shell with that administration password to raise our privileges. So we're still the demo user. We put it in the background. And then we run our script, which includes our new username and password. This is a post attack on the existing shell. And we create a new shell, and then we have administrator permissions. 
Okay, so that is one workstation that we have compromised, and now we wanted to move around to look for better targets. That's what we're going to do now. So first we're going to uh, deploy our um, tool, which is going to map out the network with a sharp mount. The sharp mount will uh, create some files, and the files, the JSON files, we're going to import into Bloodhound, and Bloodhound will give us the, the visibility we need to have in order to find the shortest path to our best target, which is the domain controller. So there we go, we start a Bloodhound. The files are important. And we have our attack path. A visual is there. Okay, so next, we're going to combine the information we already extracted from the user accounts. We've got the hashes, and we're going to combine all that information also with other accounts we have found, and combine that into a ticket we're going to create, and the ticket is going to grant us access to the domain controller, so we are able to create a remote connection with that ticket and deploy our malware. So first we need the hash. And there it is. Then we go into the shell. We start up Mimikatz. And we combine the hash with the user we want, and we have a ticket to be able to use for the domain controller. So the only thing we have to do now is create a remote connection with the domain controller, copy our malware to a system we can copy it from, and from there we copy it over to the domain controller and execute it. So it's already now being copied on the domain controller. The malware is uh, named new.exe. And in a PowerShell window, we can just execute this file. And there it is. You can notice the system has been encrypted with GrantCrab ransomware. And the ransomware note is being displayed. OK. So what we can do now is to see if there is any evidence of this attack. And therefore, we're going to use a SIEM system. And a SIEM system will have all the logs of all the endpoint devices of all the servers in the network. That's the way how it's been traditionally done. And when you're configuring all this stuff together to make sure the log folders are forwarding the right information, then at the end you look like this. So we have a ransomware node as evidence, and that is something which is where we are interested in to start our research with. So we're going to start a query which is going to look for that information. And in this example, you will notice we have found some ransomware nodes. Other indicators of compromise we are interested in are, for instance, the clearing of the event log, because an attacker will probably try to hide the traces, and that will also leave an event behind we can use as an evidence. Next, we are interested if there is macro files are being used or uh, malicious tools like Sharphound or anything like that are being used is also a nice way to threat hunt on. Not mentioned here, um, the disabling of antivirus, for instance, can also be a nice indicator of compromise to uh, search for. 
So what we've seen until now is a red teaming exercise and a blue team exercise. And in the red teaming part, we're doing the offense kind of game where we're going to an attack system and see if we can try uh, to maintain access and to deploy our malware. And in the blue team, we'll try to um, see if they are able to detect this kind of uh, attacks and if they're able to mitigate them. Okay, and if that all goes well, then at the end, you can have a really good backup after such an attack you can use in order to go to a previous known, a good known state. But what happens then, when a backup could also be infected with a certain um, malware that will execute after some time and then all your backups are encrypted as well. Also what can go wrong is humans obviously can make mistakes, they can click on the link for instance, and then you can have as much as uh, defense kind of mechanisms in your network, but when a user clicks on a link, then you have an incident. Um, if you are in a ransomware attack, usually there is panic, and in a panic situation, um, could be that you don't have access anymore to a server or to a data center, and if it's not clear in the procedure, who do you need to contact or where do you need to go, you can run to in a lot of problems. Obviously, malware will eventually run on workstations. The obfuscation techniques will be better, better in the examples I just showed you. There was no obfuscation at all, but be aware that's the case in, in real life, and then we just have to deal with that and also to prepare. And as you just shown, uh, zero day vulnerability, it was there in Microsoft Word, so we have to deal with these as well. So what are you going to do then? Um, I must admit that in the most exercises I did, the end advice was to provide multi-factor authentication. And it's often being used as a silver bullet to take all your problems away. Now I was still wanted to point out that Multi-factor authentication is very good to have, but it's not magic. So you should really be aware um, how to apply this. So for instance, if you have a system with high privilege accounts in Active Directory, for instance, and you want to protect these with multi-factor authentication um, from Azure, and synchronize all your high privilege accounts to Azure in order to be able to m make use of that service, you might consider yourself thinking if that would be a good idea or not. So yes, uh, in order to um, prevent the things you will have in your backups uh, with a logic pump, for instance, make sure you have your backups right protected and at least um, use any form of immutable data. Or even better, put them offline somewhere. Obviously, um, you should use uh, practice cyber resilience and Basically, that means uh, run the patches, uh, make sure you apply least privileges, and all that. I think I don't uh, have to tell you, it's just do the right thing. Okay, that's easy to say, and in large corporations, usually that is the case, but if you look at small organizations, security doesn't necessarily uh, has to be a priority, right? So, therefore, uh, if you're in such a situation, I would advise, so make use of the things you already know and apply that into your own exercises. So, I wasn't ready yet. <laughs> um, what about cloud? Well, cloud could be a gift and a curse, and I would say um, a gift, because the cloud, like Azure and AWS, they have fantastic tools you can use to even improve your security. Like Security App, for instance, Azure has Defender ADP. But be aware, if you're on a public cloud, that there are multiple challenges you need to take. Obviously, um, detection with SIEM, and if my example, I showed a traditional SIEM, but there's also a way to protect your, uh, your endpoints with EDR, and a couple of years ago, or maybe even longer, EDR was just beginning, and it was a nice to have, and nowadays you can't even think you can do without. Obviously, use proper network uh, segmentation in order to prevent lateral movement from happening, and I would say document 
when you ever get attacked, document every step, and then you can prepare for a next attack. And privilege you mentioned, don't bet only on one horse, don't think MFA or EDR will take off your, all of your problems away, combine all these strategies, and make sure you apply defense in depth and do the proper thing. So, I hope you enjoyed it. This was it. And if there are any questions, I will, I will be around and I can answer them if anyone has one. Thank you. There is some time for questions, just a few. So if someone has one, please, yeah, I see one from the back. Walk to the microphone, great. And see a second person coming to the microphone. Let's see who's first, let's see who's first. Yeah, the person in the back is first. Go, uh, go hey ahead. everybody, um, see, always practice running. That way you get to get to the microphone first and ask your question. In all seriousness, um, I've heard some very interesting but super anecdotal case studies of ransomware being used by APTs that have been extracting data and then actually using ransomware attacks to hide the traces that an APT has been there or to essentially disguise an APT as a ransomware gang rather than a serious attack by a foreign government to extract data. And I'm just curious if, as I said, the data I heard about it has been super anecdotal, so I'm just curious if you've witnessed it in your work. Um, can you look me up uh, after this talk? Because there are a lot of things I don't want to disclose here for a large public. But I've, I definitely have some experience with the advanced persistent threat, yes. Cool, good question. All right, next one. Well, not a question, only two comments. Thank you for your demonstration here, but Sharpound don't need local administrative permission. You can run it as a user. I think you know it. But you demonstrate to be local administrator first, and after that you run Sharpound, but it runs directly. And the other point, um, the ransomware yeah, attacks the entire Active Directory and therefore it's a good recommendation to separate the backup system out from the Active Directory. Yeah, That's it. Thanks. <laughs> two comments. Oh, it was no question. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> two comments. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks for that. Yeah. Or, or you should have any reaction on that. <laughs> uh, if there is still time, uh, I don't know. Are there no questions? We've got two minutes. I don't know if there's another question from the audience at this moment. I don't see anyone. So then, uh, if you want to react on that, you have still one minute, or you can then join the discussion with that uh, person, or perhaps other persons later. It's okay. Yeah, let's uh, wrap up then. That's yeah. good for that. Yeah, okay. Okay. I'm sort of curious. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>